Pastor Scott and I were kind of talking about, we were reviewing the, the, the content of the last three weeks, and I really wanted to make this last week something that would be somewhat culminating. Um, and also, it is my hope that we have a few minutes at the end, at least, because I really, really, really um, find your input very life-giving to me, to hear what you learned and how you took what we've talked about and what you're going to do with it when you go home with your own loved ones. So we'll just go from there. Um, I wanted to start by just kind of circling back to our first lesson together, which is that connection starts at home. Um, And the foundations of attachment, of course, come in the parent-child relationship and that we learn um, so much about who we are um, as children of God and as special, precious, important people through those primary relationships. And then the interesting thing is, is whatever we learn from there, we sort of co-opt into our other relationships throughout the world. But really a lot of, if you think of sort of the time that we spend in the home and then you move forward into the time that we spend in the rest of the world with all of these multiple relationships we have elsewhere, we spend a lot of time with other relationships, sort of building on who we learned we were fundamentally from the home. And so what I think would be kind of cool to do today is sort of take that and talk about how we can grow together in our communities outside of the home. See, the way I kind of see it is is we all bring with us all of these elements of of identity that started in the home relationship um, and then we mesh together in communities and specifically today um, we'll be talking a little bit about church communities and how we can sort of recognize our brokenness and the, the best the, the best efforts of those who love us most you know our attachment figures owing to the fact that they're not going to get it perfect and we as our as ch- parents aren't going to get it perfect either and then we come to church and then we like have to deal with each other like with all of our stuff right and so that's um let's go to the next slide that's kind of i found this and i thought this was a lot of fun it says um church is not something you go to it's a family you belong to and so if that is our paradigm we recognize that we are all working together in community to try to help one another come Um, become healed, become more the body of of Christ. And um, I thought about this a lot um, this week as I was preparing my thoughts and praying about them and really trying to um, do God's will in in the work that I'm going, in my my time with you today. And I I remembered, I've done a little bit of, uh, quite a little bit of speaking um, to folks who um, in this area around like mental health and family relationships. I remember one person asking me one time like, what do, how do I help somebody who is struggling in a way that I just really can't relate to? Like, say, for example, I've never been, um, you know, on the brink of having my lights turned off, or I've never suffered with um, obsessive compulsive disorder or something like that. Like, how do I relate to somebody when I just don't simply share their struggle? Um, and I gave an answer but I don't think I gave a very good answer, which is always nice in some ways, because then you go home and then you like, think for four days about it, like, what should have I said? Like, what is the right answer to that? Because I think we all do that. Like, we, we, we don't exactly all share the same struggles, but we all share this fact that we all do struggle. So um, as I started thinking about that, I thought, like, the people in my world, like, there are those who struggle with, um, you know, a death of a spouse or a child, or, or there are those who wish that they um, had a family, that they wish to be married and kind of have a traditional family, and, they, and that hasn't happened to them. Or they struggle with mental illness issues. Um, a dear friend of mine, her husband committed suicide, and she's a single mom. Um, there are those who wish they could give birth to children, and, and that's not something that's, that, that's possible. Or those who are transitioning out of parenthood, um, or li- living with... Um, addiction or love those who struggle with addiction or I mean there's I, it just in this room but you know we are a room of people who have deep struggle every one of us and we all don't always know what each of us are struggling with and there may, may be a time where we feel like nobody really gets what I'm struggling with and we start to become um, we start to feel very very alone And so that, as I was thinking about all of these sort of situations of the human condition, 
that make us feel separate and make us feel like nobody gets us. That would have been my answer that I would have given that friend. And I want to break, you know, what I want to talk about is two things that we as, as communities of believers can do better at and that I particularly try hard to do better at myself. What I would have said to that friend is do your very best to not let anybody suffer and struggle alone. That is our joint ministry. I don't even know how to pronounce this, this name, but this is something I, I think about clinically all the time. Um, and I think about in my own struggles, that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. And the difference there is in whether we suffer or whether we are feeling that pain in isolation or in community, that we live in a fallen world. And so we are going to experience pain of all of those different kinds. And I didn't even like think of them all. You know, I didn't mention all of them. I just kind of thought of some of them or some that have touched me personally. Um, that we will feel pain and suffering comes when we don't feel like anybody understands us, when we feel like we're doing this alone. Oftentimes those who have struggled with with a lot of trauma, some pretty intense trauma, one example that is very clear through the research is rape, which is that those who report back their struggles with rape talk often about the fact that the incident itself was horrible but the trauma actually comes more deeply when they were not believed afterwards or they were not supported and they felt as if they were alone. That to me is mind-blowing considering the intensity of an experience itself, is that the, the, what we do after we have been hurt or we have been exposed to horrible things, if we can reach around people and gather them towards us in community, makes all the difference. Um, my husband and I just returned with our kids on a summer vacation to Washington, D.C., and this, of course, is always this kind of... Um, Content is always on my mind. It's very close to my heart. So I'm thinking about it and incorporating it into what I'm thinking, you know, what I'm, you know, my, my quiet moments of contemplation. And I was really interested in this idea of, of solitude um, as opposed to isolation and community. When I was, as we were touring around D.C., and it occurred to me something very, very interesting. If you look at the, the struggle, the deep societal struggle around those who suffered um, as a consequence of the Vietnam War, um, that's a population of, of deeply injured, wounded people. We all know that. And as I thought about it, and I've done some reading and study about it, uh, it occurred to me that a lot of the reason why their struggle happens to be particularly poignant and intense is because they were a community that didn't have, they weren't supported when they got home. They were not welcomed with open arms. They were not celebrated. Um, they felt very alone. They didn't come and go in, in battalions and troops. They came and left individually. And then they came home to sort of figure it out by themselves. And if you can contrast that to another experience I had in D.C. in our, in our touring, um, another population of people who struggled and suffered intensely is the Holocaust victims, who I don't want to downplay the way they struggled and even the way they recovered, but they recovered in community. They had people from the be- you know, all the way through, if you listen to the stories of those who went through this, because of the community around their faith and you know th- there was a strength and a depth of like togetherness that helped them to where these two populations uh, have recovered as the generations have passed in very very different ways feeling a lot of um pain and and rightfully so they they they, they both went through horrible experiences um but the difference is isolation as opposed to healing and community so i want to take that to um so this speaks just a little bit to, okay, let me, let me just throw this in here really quick. Next slide. Um, the, re, the roots of resilience are to be found in a sense of being understood by and existing in the mind and the heart of a loving, attuned, and self-possessed other. And so that's where we as a community can remember that resilience happens, this ability that we each have that God gave us, like the, the, the help is already inside of us. We're not creating something that was never there when we're recovering from struggle in community, we're just bringing that out in each other. And I really, really like to look at everyone that I see from that paradigm, that we're not creating something that wasn't there. We're just bringing that out in them. And we find that through the healing relationships that each of us have the capacity to do. This is not like a therapist thing. It's not even like a pastor thing. Sorry, pastor, sorry. (laughs) I'm just kidding. It's not, right? I mean, we have the capacity to bring about healing and self-writing because that's how God made us. 
And so I love that. And I want to just think about, okay, so, so not letting people feel alone is my first point. And I want to just um, share with you a little bit that re the reason why I feel very, very deeply about this, and I want to take you back to a personal experience of mine from long ago. Um, so when, when I was in college, my parents were going through a divorce. And it was one of those things where it, it had kind of been culminating for, for many years, and it finally kind of happened um, right there in those quite developmentally important, precarious launching years. Um, going, you know, I'd just moved out, um, and I, I was I was a uh, quite avoidantly attached. So quite honestly, <laughs> it didn't really impact me very much. It was fine. Like who needed parents? You know, like that kind of unhealthy. <laughs> Um, but it was a big deal, you know, looking back. I realized that I, I didn't have a support system. And, and, and my, my community, um, roommates, church, family even, extended family, um, I think in the spirit of not knowing what to say, they didn't really say anything. And it's, a, it's an awkward thing. I mean, I get that. It's uncomfortable. You don't know what to say. You can't, you can't fix someone's pain. There's a lot of times where we just don't have the right words. And so consequently, um, I walked about this period of my life very alone. And um, I kind of, I feel like I kind of looked like that girl up top. I dated a lot. I was getting good grades. I was having sort of a superficially lovely college experience, but I was feeling, again, in retrospect, as I have matured and had the, uh, the courage and the support to reflect upon my life, I was, I was suffering from a quite a great deal of anxiety, um, hiding it quite well, but I was living in a world that was very lonely. And um, as time went by and I was able to learn more about myself and have the courage to look at my own story, one thing came out of that, well a lot of things came out of that, but one thing very powerfully came out of that, which was this, is I will never see somebody struggling and say nothing. I will walk up to them and I will be very clunky and awkward and probably maybe say the wrong thing, but I will, I will do my very best to help them feel as if I want to at least be near them and understand that they are not alone. So I um, was inspired. It was only just about maybe five, well, maybe a little more than that, maybe 10 years ago. Um, I got a random note from my roommate from college. We've lost touch, but you know, because of Facebook, there's that way that we can sort of reconnect and things like that. Um, she wrote me a note and said, Dear Valerie, I've been thinking about you, and I just want to say I'm sorry. While we were roommates at college, you were going through a very, very difficult time, and I didn't have the courage to come and talk to you and put my arm around you and, and be with you in your struggle. And it's taken me many years, and I don't remember exactly what she said, but basically it had taken her many years to come to the maturity and the realization that she wished she could have walked by me and helped me not be alone. And so, of course, this touched me deeply and reconfirmed to me my commitment that no matter what the struggle is, even if I don't relate personally, I will have the courage to not let someone be alone. Now, this opportunity came to me um, just, a f just a little while after I got that letter. Next slide. As I... Um, was given the opportunity in my own church community to be the president of a women's organization of about 120 women. And I was in my early 30s. I was not experienced. I didn't have, um, I, I spent the entire time doing that responsibility wondering why I, in the world I had been asked to do this because I felt very um, ill-equipped. And I remember getting a phone call one day that one of the women in my congregation's son who was serving in Iraq had been in a... Hummer, and he was the medic, and he, they had been hit by a roadside bomb, and he was in really bad shape. Mind you, I had a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a one-year-old. I was a very young mom. I was very inexperienced, and immediately my thoughts are, uh, you know, can I write her a note? Like, can I send her a cake? You know, like, like I, didn't, I didn't know what to say. I just, I didn't know what to say, and, and yet I came back to this idea of she's in struggle, and anything that I do is better than nothing. 
And so I dug deep and I got in my car and I drove to her home and I sat with her and we cried together. And she was terrified. She didn't know. All she knew was this very, very little minimal information. She didn't know what was going to happen and if he was going to be okay. And, um, but I remember the sacredness of that moment of not shying away from being with her in her struggle, even though I did not truly understand what it was like to have a grown son in Iraq in a hospital having been terribly injured in a bomb. But that early experience in my own life taught me on some level how to be in a community and feel others' pain. All right. So my number two, my number one point is please let's not let each other be alone, even if we're not exactly where, you know, understanding, um, or at least our experiences may be different. My second point that I want to spend just a few minutes on is this, is that true human connection requires empathy, which we've spent some time on. Empathy is a big deal. Um, but it also requires some degree of vulnerability, that we need to allow ourselves to show up we need to allow ourselves to be seen. And I think this is really a big deal in church communities because I think there's this one, at least this is my perception, I guess I'm just speaking from my own observations as I get to go, go about different church communities, that I think sometimes it feels very tempting to feel like we all just need to show up and look super put together. Like that's, you know, that's like, um, I can't show up and be messy, like, because I'm a believer and I'm trying to do my best and if we're doing our best then it should be playing out in the way everybody behaves and looks and, and you kind of look around and think, man, you know, if you're not feeling that way, you look around and think, man, everybody's so put together. Like, holy cow, I just, you know, I don't, I don't, feel, I don't feel like I'm, I fit, you know, and so, and so I think that's something that I, that, that's important to think about is like, once again, we are all sitting here working through our own private journeys um, of struggle. And it's okay to be, to show up and be real and to be who we are. Because I think what happens is this. If we, if we don't let ourselves be seen very much, um, we, we might communicate a couple of different things. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, one of them is this. Um, we might communicate, your struggles make me uncomfortable and I can't relate to you. Now, we all know what it feels like when we show up and we share something and everybody just goes, whoa, like, that must be really bad. Like, that idea of, like, I don't get you. And what do we do immediately when that happens, you know, in, in this kind of a setting or anywhere, even if you're, you know, going to coffee with a friend or whatever. Like, immediately we kind of clam up. Like, we're just like, okay, never mind. Like, we don't feel seen. We don't feel um, understood. And so we certainly don't feel safe enough to show up and then, like, work together together. Um, to find that healing that we only we in community can find together. Um, the next thing that could happen, that, that may happen when we kind of you know put up the stop sign, is we may be communicating on a slightly deeper level. I see your struggle, but your struggle scares me because I recognize that I too have struggles, and your struggles make me feel uncomfortable about my struggles. So the first piece is I don't even have any. I don't want to go there. The second one is I have some, but I'm not super comfortable dealing with these things. And so, again, but the, but the, the, the impact of that is it's a push away. It's not a come near me. Like, let's do this thing together. Let's find healing together through relationship, which, which is exactly why we meet in community. You know, why we meet together um, to vulnerably try to sort of be real, show up, and find healing through relationship. Okay, so what we're shooting for is the next thing, which is showing up and being vulnerable. I see your struggle. I understand it because I have my own struggles. My pain may not look exactly like yours, but it doesn't frighten me. My unique suffering has made me more equipped to see yours, and I want to stay near you so that neither of us have to feel the worst of all things, which is to struggle and to be alone in that struggle. Um, I mean, that really is it right there. Like, that is what we, God wants us to do. He wants us to show up and be able to, like, lift one another 
and work together and not be fearful that whatever we're experiencing just certainly is either too big or too different than what anybody else is experiencing. So I'm thinking about this, which is, this is one of my, Thornton Wilder um, produced a one-act play called The Angel That Troubled the Waters. He took it from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And what it's about, I mean, you're probably familiar with that, but just to kind of play out the way he articulated it in this play, it's about a physician who comes to the pool of Bethesda, and he keeps trying to get to the waters because he has something that is very painful for him that he's trying to overcome, and he keeps having struggles getting to the water. He cannot find himself, he, he can't get there. And finally, as this, this uh, play goes on, an angel physically blocks his way. And he's like, are you, what are, you, are you kidding me? I've got, I'm here, I want to get better, I'm in tons of pain. I just want to get better. I want this to go away. And the angel says this, without your wound, where would your power be? It is your very remorse that makes your low low voice tremble into the hearts of men. The very angels themselves cannot persuade the wretched and blundering children on earth as can one human being broken on the wills of living. In love's service, only the wounded soldiers can serve. Now draw back. That is beautiful. And that gives our struggles meaning. It doesn't make them right, but it makes them sacred. And it gives us the power to then turn around and be healers in God's name. That we can take our struggles and our hurts and we can use them because only the wounded soldiers have the power to heal. And I'm, I'm reminded of this all the time, all the time, that I am drawn to people who have the courage to show up and to show how they are wounded soldiers and to relate to me from their own place of brokenness. I was just recently working with a young man who clinically um, comes to my private practice, and I, I say this about all of them, but it's true about all of them. I love this. I love this kid with all of my heart. He's overcoming, um, in a in a beautiful way, some sexual addiction issues, and um, we've really, really come to love one another. And I worked really hard with him. And just a week or two ago, we were talking about the power that this young man has. He's 18 years old. He just graduated from high school. His addiction in history started at about 14, 15. And I said to him, you have a unique gift that for the rest of your life, as you approach and are confronted with young men who struggle with sexual addiction, you can talk to them about your own journey and your own battle. You know, you are a warrior and you have a special gift that you can offer to people in struggle who are feeling incredibly hopeless and who are feeling like they can never escape and that they can never overcome, and they, they're feeling the shame and the, you know, the loneliness and the despair that comes with what your struggle is, and you can talk to them in a way that is incredibly unique to you, that, that, you know, that I, even I can't, because you know, that is not my struggle. I can speak to them from my place of struggle, but he, in that way, is a wounded soldier, and he has that power to heal, and I, could just, I loved, what, as I was talking to him, his face kind of lit up, like, yeah, like, I have a special mission here. Not like, you know, he wanted, he was glad he had gone through the hell that he had been through, but like, again, it was making his own mission something sacred that he could then turn to the glory of God. And I, I mean, that is a beautiful thing. All right, so I want to share with you, um, this is on my desk. This is one of my guiding statements. And this sort of speaks to quite a bit of what I've been saying so far. This is, this is by Pema Chodron. She's a, a Buddhist nun. It's this, it says, compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It is a relationship of equals. Only when we know our own darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. So what this precludes is that we have to have just a ton of courage 
to be able to look at our own darkness. If we're running from that, we are not going to have a high tolerance for sitting with others in theirs. And so that means there's a lot of personal work that needs to be done, um, which is difficult. It's a struggle. Um, I, I certainly learned early on that, I, you know, it's kind of funny, I chuckle that I don't know if I would have opted, if I would have had the courage to do the work that I do if I knew what it was going to cost me in my own, like, journey to learn about my own pain and my own struggle. Um, because I had, I had learned quite early and quickly to just make that go away and not feel it. But consequently, what it did, if I don't feel my own, I don't have the capacity to feel yours. Yours reminds me of mine. I don't want to think about mine. And so anyhow, when I walked down this road and I started, I started this journey, all of a sudden it became very um, obvious that my work first would be within myself and as I was able to gain an increased capacity to um, look at my own healing and experience that on my, my healing that comes certainly by the grace of God that I could have this inc intensely increased capacity to have compassion on those around us, on me. And th again, that is not just something specific to my journey. It's something that each of us can do. So to go along with this, um, I'm th I'm, I was just reading this, this actually I just read yesterday, a little story about um, a mom and a dad who had sent their little girl to school and there was a lot of strict instructions to like make sure you come straight home you know like no no you know don't stop anywhere because they were worried about her she's a little little gal and um, one day she was five minutes late and then she was ten minutes late and then she was fifteen minutes late and the parents started worrying that you know she was tiny tiny little girl and she finally rolls in, and mom and dad are pretty frantic. They're like, where have you been? Like, th very, very nervous. And she's like, oh, mommy, I, I, s I was walking home, just like you said, and little Amy was sitting on her front doorstep crying because she had lost her doll. And so mom and dad kind of look at each other, and they're like, so you stopped to help Amy find her doll? She said, no, Mommy, I stopped to help Amy cry. And I love that story because it kind of takes us back to this idea that there are going to be times and probably quite a few times where we as community really and truly cannot fix the thing that the other is experiencing. Nobody in my circle as a 19-year-old young college student could fix my parents' marriage. But they could stop and sit on the front doorstep and help me cry. And sometimes that is what we each need. That makes our pain bearable. And it helps us feel that we are not alone. And it also puts us in touch with God's love for us through the association of others who he brings into our paths to comfort us. And that is our work. And that is our capacity. That's what we can do. And so as I was thinking about these things, I was brought back to the, the greatest example of all, which is our Savior Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry. And I was really pondering my relationship with him. And I was pondering what draws me to him. That he... I was kind of thinking about this idea of the resurrected Savior and his power and glory and, you know, all knowingness and all of these things which I know and I love. And yet at the same time, I was, I was really struck by the fact that what draws me to my Savior isn't those things as much as his willingness to come down and feel what I feel that he chose not to be identified by his power and glory, but he chose to be identified by his kindness and by his compassion and by his desire to just be with the common people and to love others and to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. You know, it, it even occurred to me the beauty of this idea that when Mary and Martha came running to him because of the death of, the, of, of Lazarus, he knew what he had the power to do 
And yet before he even did that, what did he do? He stopped to help them cry. In his case, he could fix it. In our cases, we can't. But in all of the cases, we can stop and help others cry, just like Jesus Christ did. So his ministry was defined by his compassion. And our ministries can be defined by our compassion to others. We find our greatest wounding in this life, interestingly enough, in relationship, but we also find our greatest capacity to heal through relationship and to come closer to God through that healing by showing that compassion in relationships that we have with others. And I say these things in Jesus Christ's holy name, amen.